Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, a.k.a. Mr. Valuation. I'm going to do something a little bit differently here today. I've had a lot of requests from a lot of the subscribers to the channel that have been asking me to kind of talk about, you know, they're really confused about what, you know, investing, whether, you know, you should be a growth investor, a dividend growth investor, and, you know, what's the difference and why are dividend stocks, you know, so popular and good and, you know, other people like growth stocks. And, you know, it really comes down to what your goals, objectives, and risk tolerances are. And, you know, frankly, if you want to make the most money over your lifetime, the best thing you can do is buy growth stocks, buy them at attractive valuations and hold them for a long time. But there's a lot of ifs involved in that statement. You got to pick the right stock. That's going to work if you pick the right company, if the company does grow, if you buy it at the right valuation. On the other hand, if you want to be more conservative, you know, there's a lot to say about dividend stocks. So I'm going to go through some exercises here. I'm not talking about any of the companies that I'm using to illustrate my points. Or I want to be very clear about that. I'm not recommending them. I'm not saying they're good investments or bad investments. I'm going to use these companies as examples to illustrate investing principles and the differences between pure growth investing versus dividend stock growth investing. And of course, I'm going to be throwing valuation into the equation at all times. So let's go ahead and get into the video. Let's start with a company called NMI Holdings. Now, what I want you to see here, this company has a really terrific record of growth. Now, they've had, you know, some negative earnings here, so I'm not calculating a growth number here. But if you look at the number, the earnings grew by 330% in 216. Then they had a minus 40%, but then 175% growth, 56% growth, and, you know, another negative year. But then, you know, some really good numbers. Now, if I take some time off of this graph, you can see that the company's averaged about 17% growth, and that includes a negative year. Drop it another year, and all of a sudden, it's 28% growth. So this is a growth stock. But here's what I want to illustrate here. I'm going to go to just before COVID. I'm going to pick a time here. I'm going to pick the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, you know, just before, just before COVID happened. And here's a growth stock that was actually technically, based on the price being below the orange line, undervalued at the time. Okay, and had you invested in it at a price of thirty three fifty seven and held it till yesterday's close, you'd have had a negative rate of return of four and a half percent. Okay, because the stock price went from thirty three fifty seven to twenty eight thirty nine, and so your ten thousand dollars would have fell to eight thousand four hundred and fifty seven. That's over you know a little more than three years, three and a half year time frame here. So valuation didn't really matter. Now I want to make a point about valuation. In contrast, had you been aggressive enough to buy this stock, you know, near the bottom, and I'm not going to pick the perfect bottom, on April of 2020 and held it to yesterday, you'd have made over 27% a year, more than doubling your money in approximately the same time frame, just about four months different time frame. So that just really gives you the idea of how valuation works. But also it talks about risk. You know, the problem with growth stocks are that there's nothing tempering your investment. Now let's go to a a really high yielding dividend growth stock, a company like Philip Morris. I call it Philip Morris. Its name is actually Eltry. It's the original Philip Morris. And let's go ahead and shorten the time frame here. And let's go to that same time frame of around December 27th or so of 2019 through yesterday's close. Okay, and here now your $10,000 investment would have also shrunk only to 8,843. It was not as dramatic of a loss. But the interesting part is you got $2,476 in dividend. So you actually ended up making a 3.51% annualized rate of return when you count dividends plus income. Now that's not reinvesting dividends. That's taking the dividends. But your $10,000 investment had a net terminal value here of $11,319. What protected you here was the dividend. Because what I want you to note here is the dividend went from $3.28 to $3.40 to $3.52 to $3.68, and it's projected to be $3.83 for this fiscal year, which, you know, ends in December. We're not quite there yet. But the point being is that the dividend gave you a buffer. Now, some other things I want to point out about a dividend growth stock, that's the white line in this graph. The dividend, no matter, no matter what the stock price does, 
the dividend is increasing every single year here because the key is when I go to performance and I look at buying the stock on January 3rd, 2003 and investing $10,000 and I would have bought 1,085.5 shares, I want you to notice that that share count, the 1,086 we call it here rounded, stays the same the whole time in this column. But look what happened to my income. I started out with a 6.63% yield. This is a high yield dividend payer, okay? And the income grew to $700 a second year, 768, 834. By the time I got down to last year, Eltria was paying me $3,995 annual income on an original $10,000 investment, and it had paid $43,960 over this time frame, that's over four times my original investment from income alone. And I got another $4,800 from capital gain. Okay, so that turned into 92000 That dramatically beat the market. And I want to make a point. That's at a point where if I put price on here, I was buying the stock when it was undervalued below either the orange or blue line. It's dramatically below the orange line here. Here the P-E ratio was 8.71. The P.E. ratio is now 9, so we've had basically the same valuation throughout that time, but we ended up with, you know, a lot of growth over that time, and we ended up with all this dividend income. That's the beauty of dividend growth stocks. Now, in contrast, okay, if I would compare that to a stock such as Alphabet, a.k.a. Google, okay, which had 35% growth over this time frame, and look at the performance. Number one is there's no dividends on this stock, but you can see earnings grew. The stock was reasonably valued at this time, very high P.E. ratio of 94, but because it was growing so fast, it actually looks reasonably valued. If I brought this back here, you would see that it was actually above the orange line at a relatively high P.E. ratio back here. But because the stock was growing so fast, if you were to put $10,000 into Alphabet, on September 2004, slightly different time frame, but very similar time frame, and held it, I want you to note that you got no dividend income whatsoever, but you turned $10,000 into $473,662. That's you know more than 10 times what you'd have made in the stock market. You'd have averaged over 22.58% a year, and that's only because you started out when the stock was so you know historically overvalued. You know, you bought it, let's say, in November of 2008 during the bottom, you know, of the Great Recession and held it through yesterday's close. You'd have still averaged 21 percent. You'd have turned 10,000 into 175. But once again, you got no dividend income. So growth stocks, as I said in my opening here, if you buy them at the right value and even if you don't buy them at the right value, I should say, if you hold them long enough and they give you the growth over time, then, you know, you can obviously do better than probably any other investment because if you compare this going back again, now I'm going to go back to max, okay? If you compare the performance turning 10,000 into 473,000 over what you'd have done in Eltria turning 10,000 into 92,000, obviously Google was the much better investment. But, you know, Will Rogers was once credited with saying he's much more interested in the return of his money than on his money. And the beauty of it is Eltria here, Philip Morris, as I like to call it, would have given you four times your original investment back in cash. It would have given you a return not only on your money, but of your money fourfold over that time frame. That's one of the dramatic differences between investing in a growth stock versus investing in a dividend growth stock. Now, I got a couple other examples here that I want to say. Here's a stock, Driven Brands, that one of the subscribers asked me for. Now, it's got very good growth rate of 28%. But yesterday, the stock fell 41% because of some disappointing earnings. They had a disappointing year. The problem with growth stocks can be that when they have a bad year, you know, you can see this kind of reaction. You normally don't find that kind of a drop with good dividend paying stocks. You look at a utility stock, for example, like Edison International, even during COVID, you know, they had a significant drop, but it wasn't really that bad. Now, the problem here is this is a relatively low growing stock, only 2% growth, pays a pretty high dividend yield. 
And the point I'm getting at is the dividend has grown every year, as you can see here, but you don't get a lot of growth here. So this is not a growth stock. This is a dividend growth stock. This is an income stock. The dividend growth rate here has been about 6%. Your $10,000 would have started out at about $229 of income in 08 using this time frame. And you'd have received, you know, $5,547 back in dividends and made a slight profit, but you would have underperformed the market because, you know, this stock is not a growth stock. It's an income paying stock. And you would be buying this for the income. And if you bought it today, you know, it's offering a 4% yield, but I would consider it overpriced. But if you'd have bought this stock during, you know, the throes of COVID, for example, you could have actually turned this into a high returning investment. So valuation matters and it matters a lot, even with low growth companies. But in contrast, if you overpay for a low growing stock like this, even though it's undervalued today, you only make 1.64%. And that includes dividend income. Okay, so I'm going to close this video or end it by looking at a couple of other stocks real quickly before I end the video. You look at a stock like Kroger. Okay, it's had a 10% growth rate. It's dramatically undervalued. The price has dropped precipitously. But yet, if I look at performance over this time frame, you can see by using the calculator here, I make almost 10% a year. I turn my $10,000 into $38,000, but I also got more than half my money back in dividend income. That's the advantage of dividend paying stocks. They continue to raise their income no matter how volatile the stock price is in between. The dividend just keeps going up, 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 up every single year. Okay, in contrast now, if you look at a stock like PayPal, okay, that, you know, had tremendous growth, you know, 16%, 27, 27, 28. It's a negative number here, so I'm not calculating the growth rate. And the stock, you know, traded at a high multiple of 34 times earnings. And then it got way up here crazy to where it was trading at 60 times earnings. And then all of a sudden, you know, you'd have lost half of your money, roughly 48.9% of your money in a matter of a couple of years, simply because it was overpriced and there was no dividend income. If you'd have bought this during COVID, you know, which I've been using that kind of the 2019 and held it today, you'd have lost annualized 10% of your money, turning 10,000 into 6,700. And again, no dividend income. That's the problem when you pay by dividend paying stocks. So let's summarize this by looking at the last company I'm going to show you here, and that's Starbucks, because I think Starbucks kind of tells the whole story. Now, number one is, if you look at Starbucks' growth rate long-term, it was 16%. I drop that into a 15-year graph, it's down to 14%. I drop it down to the you know 10 years, it's 11%. And if I look going forward, analysts are expecting it to grow at 17%. So this is a growth stock, okay? But the point is, by looking here, the white line is the dividend. The company did not start paying a dividend till 2010. Okay, so let's look at the difference between the stock when it paid a dividend versus a time when it was simply growing. If I'd have bought the stock, you know, back here, even though it was overpriced, let's say in 2004, again, I'm using December timeframes just to try to make the math work. And I held it, you know, through, let's say, December of 09. Okay, I would have lost 6.8% of my money. And this was a time when the stock, the business did great. Growth earnings by 20%, 40%, 28%. Of course, they had a bad year during the Great Recession, but then they followed that with 13% growth. And then they ended up making 60% growth the next year. But you lost money because you overpaid and the stock was very, very vulnerable. Okay, now on contrast, if I'd have paid, you know, a high P.E. ratio during this period of time when the stock was paying a dividend, and let's say not the same time frame here, I'm not going to have the same time frame, but I held it during COVID, I still ended up breaking even and making a little bit of money. My stock ended up breaking even and I got about $850 in dividends. So, you know, having the dividend as part of the equation can really reduce risk and minimize the risk. And it also returns your capital over time. With every dividend check, you're getting a return of capital as well as a return on capital. And I think that's very important to understand that distinction between the pure dividend growth stock and the growth stock. Now, if you'd have overpaid for Starbucks back here 
in 2006 and held it through the depths of the recession, you'd have lost 78% of your money, okay? But if you'd have held the stock, this is where growth stock investing can work if you have the psychology for it. If you'd have held the stock through the recession and through COVID, you'd end up averaging over 11% a year. And then here you did get some dividend income because the company did start paying a dividend about three or four years out. So that's really the big distinction between dividend growth stock investing and growth stock. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival. Now, what's the bottom line here? Is growth stock investing better than dividend growth stock investing? If you're trying to make pure amounts of money and willing to take risk, then I would, I, I've always favored growth stock investing. You know, Peter Lynch was famous for that in his 10 baggers and 20 baggers and so on. But on the other hand, if you're looking for, you know, a more conservative way to invest the money and you need income, you can count on the dividends significantly and, you know, much more reliably than you can on the fluctuating stock price, as you saw here throughout this video. So, you know, which is better? It really depends on the individual, depends on your time frame, depends on how good you are at picking the right growth stock. You pick the right growth company and hold it for the long run, you can do very, very well, better than you can with your typical dividend paying stock. But on the other hand, if you own your you know, typical dividend paying stock that's steady eddy, like a Johnson and Johnson, for example, or you know, Coca-Cola, Procter and Gamble, you know, the classic dividend paying stocks, you don't usually get as much volatility, although it can happen, but you end up getting that income coming in every year, and that income is growing with those kind of like dividend aristocrats or champions, regardless of whether the stock price is rising or falling because you're paid on the number of shares you own. So what's the, you know, the difference? It depends on who you are, what your attitude is, and whether you have the stomach. Starbucks, you know, very few people could have held Starbucks for three or four years like I showed in the video and lost 78% of their money and held on. They'd have long sold out and lost all that. And they would not have made all the money that they would have made if they'd have held on to Starbucks. But on the other hand, if you own a dividend paying stock and you're getting that income, and even if you own a stock like, you know, we, we, we had a recent video on AT&T and Verizon and the, you know, the stock price is dropping, but your income keeps coming in and you keep getting that check and you say you're retired and living off the dividend, it's a lot easier to hold on. So I just wanted to give you some insights into the real differences between growth stock investing and dividend growth stock investing. And remember, growth is also varied. Some stocks grow fast, some stocks grow slow, some stocks grow to you know average rate. You know, so all of those things factor into how well you do as a long-term investor. And it all comes down to what suits you, what your attitude is like, what your investor psychology is like. Because investor psychologists have taught us People hate the fear of loss or the, the, the pain of loss two and a half times greater than they enjoy the pleasure of gain. And don't ever forget that. You know, it's, it's fear and greed are the two emotions that drive investors, and fear is the most powerful of the two. Thanks for watching. If you like the video, ring the bell. You know, subscribe to the channel if you don't already. And, you know, subscribe to FastGraphs. It's such a powerful tool that can really help you. It'll teach you how to invest. You know, if you look at all the different aspects here and how the different valuations, and remember, it's the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. It lets you analyze stocks deeper and faster than ever before. Thanks for watching and talk to you again real soon.